Good morning. Good to be back together. I'm Rob, one of the pastors here. We're going to try this again. If you were here last week, um, you might recall I was all over the place. And so forgive me for that because I was all over the place. There was so much going on in John's gospel. But today we're in chapter four, which is, as Kelsey said, is the woman at the well. And it's a beautiful um, interaction with Jesus. And so I am, Aaron's going to do this for us again from the standpoint of kind of graphically representing some of the conversations that we're putting out here. Because here in chapter 4, this is the last part for us of the first section of John's Gospel. Starting next week, we're still going to be in John's Gospel, but in different areas. We really have walked through these first four chapters. And what's beautiful about today is we've gone from the beginning and John the Baptist, right? And then John the Baptist baptizing at the River Jordan, and Jesus being identified as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and then Jesus going from there and calling the disciples to follow him. From there we went to the wedding at Cana, which is the first time where Jesus performs a miracle, and there is so much richness there as well, and and water being made from water into wine. There after the wedding at Cana, Jesus goes in and he cleanses the temple, and that kind of shakes things up and gets, gets attention. After that, we get to Nicodemus, which then Jesus now is going from those who know who he is and have questions to Nicodemus to this one-on-one conversation with someone that has just a bunch of questions and Jesus talking about what is happening in what the kingdom of God, that is Jesus, is bringing into the world and that interaction. And then here we're in chapter 4, and this is where Jesus really opens up what he has brought to the rest of the world. So we're just going to walk through this. There's some images and there's some things that kind of ring true, which is a beautiful thing through here. So we'll see how this ends up here at the end of the, of the, uh, the time. Like we did last week, though, let's, let's pray. I want to invite the Spirit. Gracious Father, we, we just invite you to send your Spirit into this place at this time. We know that John wrote his message his telling of the good news of Jesus Christ at that time and that place for a reason and so that we could be in it today. I pray, Father, that your spirit's present. I know that there is something for everyone here in person online that you have for them by your spirit in their life and so I pray that you'd make that evident today and in the days and weeks to come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So let's just read through chapter four here as we get going. Verse one. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat warily beside the well at about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw well, to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. So here it begins. So um, quickly in John's telling of this, Jesus and his disciples have been walking all day and traveling. They, they go through this, this kind of stranger land, if you will, one that wouldn't be comfortable or natural for Jews to be present in, but they do. So Jesus quickly kind of you know, takes the group into foreign territory, if you want to think of it that way. And, and what happens? Lo and behold, there's some messaging going on. That is to say, the disciples go into town, Jesus is by himself, and a Samaritan woman comes to the well, which he engages with. That part shouldn't be surprising. Asking her for a drink, and she recognizes how strange this interaction is because this is a a generations-old conflict between Samaritans and Jews. And yet Jesus, in typical way, is operating on a different level than what the woman thought they were operating on. And what does Jesus say? 
He asked for a drink, and she says, what are you asking me for a drink for? If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. Now, last week, we spent a lot of time talking about, right, the different images, the different aspects of what John's gospel, how, how water has been so present from the very beginning. We go back to the, to the time of John the Baptist, the River Jordan baptizing, and the wedding at Cana, and, and Nicodemus being born of water and the Spirit. And here we are again at a well, and Jesus using water to demonstrate and talk about what he is bringing, what he is giving, how God is giving something to the world in a way that is new, that is refreshing, is always moving, as we just sang about. Never, sta- never kind of just sits. It's always active, always active. And it made me think about what, well, what did he, that is Jesus, tell Nicodemus in chapter 3, verse 16. He said, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. This is the gift that Jesus is telling the woman about. If you knew who I was, he says, you would understand the gift that God is giving. And this gift is is saving the world through the giving of his Son. And this is the one who was in her presence, who was there at the well with her that day. Now, that's in the context of the story. To be fair, for us who are not there in the story, we can kind of see the fullness of what this means, this idea of living water. And I want to give us a little bit of a preview because, as I said last week, this actually connects beautifully with John's revelation, the last book in the Scriptures. John, at the very end of that, in verse 21, verse 6, he says this as he's describing the vision that he saw from Jesus. John said, and he also said, this is Jesus, he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. And again, in Revelation chapter 22, the first verse, John says this, Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. See, this this language that Jesus seemingly conveys just about this water that would well up to eternal life that he promises. Sorry, Siri, I'm not talking to you that he promises to this woman at the well is, I mean, it connects this whole thing together for John. Right? Be reminded of what I said last week. John is the, lo- the latest, the oldest writer of a gospel in the New Testament, really of any book. And he is looking at this, and these things are being tied together for him. And he's telling the story of, of the beginning of Jesus' public ministry on some level in, John, in his gospel, chapter 4, about talking about the water which would well up for eternal life. And we can see the gift of God. We can see the vision that in Revelation John talks about, that water is so important as far as how God works. And it's so important that it's actually part of the new creation. The new Jerusalem, which is described in Revelation 21 and 22, that water would flow through the streets and it gives life. It gives life eternal. This is what Jesus is promising the woman there. Does she get it right away? Probably not. (laughs) Does she get it? Because this is an ongoing, again, a lovely part of what John's gospel does, the evangelist, the author, is that he gives us these long interactions. Okay, so, so here we have already the introduction, right, that the woman has come to the well. Jesus has asked her for a drink. She's recognized the conflict of the Jew and the Samaritan. And Jesus offers the promise of God to someone that is not just part of his family, the Jews. Again, verse 10, I'll just read this and then we'll go into verse 11. Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you. What is that? That gift of the giving of his son for the forgiveness of all your sins. And who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Verse 11, she replies, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. And this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, 
Do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. See, the discussion here is one that they're on kind of almost like in different places. There. She's there in the present, like, what's going on? How, how can you get water? You don't even have a, I mean, really? How would you give me water, you Jew? How would you give me water? You have nothing to get water out of the well. And it's like, look, you're not, you're not getting it here. And, and I'm sure in a kind of a loving way. Well, the water I give would well up to eternal life. The water that I would give is something that is going to change everything that you experience. In fact, again, we go forward and this harkens to when Jesus and John's gospel is upon the cross. In chapter 19, verse 34, after Jesus has died, we're told that one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water flowed out. There's a beautiful connection here in John's gospel about how, how Jesus, the water which he gives, which wells up to eternal life, is not just something from a well. In fact, it is water that would come out of his, his own sacrificed body. Upon the cross, that John would tell us that after his death, after giving up his spirit, that the soldier would pierce his side and water and blood would flow out. This is the giving of the forgiveness of sins that in John chapter 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus of, that God so loved the world that he gives his only son so that whoever believes would have life eternal. And we see how these pieces are coming together here. Granted, we get a bit more information. The reader versus the woman at the well in the story here are in different places. We have the full picture on this side of the cross, which hopefully allows us to be able to think about what's the implication for our lives. Verse 15. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Verse 16. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. Okay. <laughs> we have a very, a very sharp twist here, right? So Jesus has laid out this you know, she's talking about water at the well, and he's offering water to her. She's getting that part of it. She's not quite sure what's going on here, I think, right? But she says, no, give me that water. I, I love that water. That sounds great, so I wouldn't have to come back here and get water regularly. She's still in that kind of, you know, everyday sort of life situation. And what does Jesus do? Go get your husband. Let's see how this plays out. Verse 16, go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman said. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. Now, she's identifying something that's going on here. You must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here on Mount Gerizim? where our ancestors worshipped. So she's identifying he's a holy man of some sort. Then she gets into some holy questions. So help me understand, if you're a holy man, you're a prophet, help me understand why you Jews say we have to go to Jerusalem to worship, but we Samaritans say we need to worship here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped. Well, again, Jesus has a tendency of kind of changing the conversation, right? Verse 21, Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter where, whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. It's a beautiful statement. 
what Jesus is doing. Someone who is living in a world of, I have to go here or there, I have to do this or do that, whether it's Samaritan or Jew. And Jesus says, just stop. Just stop. There's something new coming, and the Father is inviting, in fact, expecting people to worship in spirit and in truth. Now, does this sound like anything else we've heard already in John's Gospel? There's been some spirit involvement, right, in John's Gospel so far. In fact, I would say that one of the beautiful themes of John's Gospel is the Spirit's activity from the very beginning through the entire book. And the Spirit keeps showing up. How did John the Baptist know who the Messiah was? The one whom the Spirit came upon and rested. What did Jesus talk to Nicodemus about? You must be born of water and the Spirit. Not from your mother's womb, right? Adam gives birth, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You must be born of water and the Spirit is what he told Nicodemus. And here now Jesus is telling, no, no, this this worship... This thing of going to the temple or going to the mountain to worship is being changed. It's all going to be changed. The Father invites you to worship in spirit and in truth. And similarly, for us, those of us, the readers of this gospel, we can make some connections here. What happens again when Jesus is on the cross? John 19, verse 30. He's given some the drink. When Jesus had tasted, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and released his spirit. See, there's some aspect here of what's happening in John's gospel is is the kingdom of God is coming in ways which were foretold for sure in the prophets. But the way they're being demonstrated and being laid out is amazingly different and miraculous on some level, yet still so, so consistent with what God has done from the beginning. And yet here we have Jesus talking about the Father just asking for worship in spirit and in truth. And the great story here is that Jesus, the Father, actually gives you the spirit to worship with. That's what happens in John 19. That's what happens with Jesus upon the cross is he gives up the spirit. See, to this point, the spirit and Jesus had been united from a from the Spirit coming upon him and John the Baptist seeing it in John's gospel. Wherever Jesus was, so too was the Spirit. And in Jesus' death upon the cross, he releases his Spirit. And that's going to happen eventually, right? We know in Acts that on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit is now given to every believer. Different. The fullness of what God promised and intended. And that's what continues still today is that we get to live in the same place of worshiping in spirit. How's it going, Aaron? Yeah? I always love to say these. Because I don't look. You guys are watching how this kind of develops, and I get to turn around. Oh. Lots of water still. Lots of blue on the board. I only have four colors. You only have four colors. That's true. Well, if you took, like, is it red and blue makes purple? It doesn't work that way. doesn't work that way? <laughs> All right, are we getting some pieces of this here? Okay, let's go back to to John chapter 4, verse 25. So again, verse 24. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything for us. And then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Verse 27, then the disciples came back. They were shocked to find him, Jesus, talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask. (laughs) I love that comment. But none of them were going to say anything about it. (laughs) What do you want with her? Or why were you talking with her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. So we we have this interaction with the woman wrapping up a bit, right? So you have Jesus who has been with her and is enjoying this interaction, I think, kind of shaking her world. And what ultimately happens, she says, we know that the Messiah is coming, the one who is going to bring this all true. 
I am. That's what Jesus says. Yep, you've got it. And what does she do? She leaves her water jar at the well and she runs back into town. She runs because she's got such great news to share. She runs because the woman who had had so many broken relationships in her life, who had struggled with, I'm, I can only imagine that these cities aren't that big, that she would be an outsider, a bit of an outcast, having had multiple husbands, and the one she's living with now isn't even her husband. I mean, think about that in a small little town. And she interacts, she intersects with Jesus at the well, and he tells her these amazing stories of everlasting life and living water that flows like a spring. And then she says, yeah, yeah, I get it. And the, and the talk of the worshiping and spirit and the truth and, and no mountain of Mount Gerizim or Jerusalem, but actually everyone will worship together. It's, it's too good to be true. And so, yeah, I get it. When the Messiah comes, he's going to make this all true. And what happens? That's me, he says. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine being in a place where all the struggles that you have with you in that moment, maybe you brought in here with you today, you interact with someone that says, no, nah, I've got something for you. I know exactly what's going on with you. You're exactly right. You've had five husbands. I know. I know. I am here with you. One-on-one. -on -one. I'm here. And what I have for you fulfills everything that has been promised. Whether it's in your family tradition as a Samaritan or the Jews, everything that has been promised is being fulfilled right here, right now. And it's for you. With all of your brokenness and messed upness and crazy ideas and disregard for me, I'm here for you. In the middle of the day, at a well that she has to go to when she can't go with other people there because she's probably too embarrassed to be fair. Who's going to go to the well in the middle of the day? The one that goes by herself. And she finds Jesus sitting there waiting for her. Maybe you can get a glimpse of how quickly she ran back into town. It, it washed away all of those experiences, those broken relationships. She had something more important to go share. <laughs> she had something that changed her life at that moment that she wanted to go share. It could not have been any more real for her, though so much of what Jesus was talking about, right, was still to come. Right? We, we have the whole story. I mean, we've read from Revelation. We saw what happened about, with Jesus upon the cross. That was still to come, but yet in the midst of her hope and promise of what was coming, she ran to go share the word. Now, what happens? The disciples show up. They come back from town, and it's like, hmm, interesting. Jesus is talking to a woman by himself. But they wouldn't ask about it, right? <laughs> so let's see how the interaction goes with Jesus and the disciples. <laughs> Uh, let's see here, verse 30, right? Let's see here, 30, yeah, there we go. So the people came streaming from the village to see him. We saw that. Verse 31 of John chapter 4. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plants and the other harvests, but... And it's true, I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. 
See, there's this dynamic going on of where Jesus takes the moment to instruct the disciples. The harvest is ripe. Now, I'm not a farmer. Anybody in here a farmer? Yeah, I mean, we live in a city and we go down to the market, we buy what we want to when we want it, right? We don't have to actually grow it. But I think it's a natural reaction of those, the disciples, to think, no, it takes time, right? When Jesus talks about being a time of harvest, that the harvest is ripe, they're thinking, well, wait a minute, what's going on here? You know, typically there's three, four months probably between you plant the seed and you harvest months later. But Jesus, again, even for the disciples, is saying, hold on, guys. You just have to worry about the harvest. The harvest is ripe. All of the planting, all of the watering, all of that's been taken care of. And he begins to get them ready to think about what the ministry is going to look like. In fact, from John chapter 12, again, we'll look forward as he'll be teaching them. Chapter 12, verse 23, Jesus says um, in this context of teaching, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. I can only imagine that when the disciples heard this from Jesus in chapter 12, talked about himself being needed to die so it would give forth more life, that they probably went back to this time at the well. They probably went back to Jesus and how he would talk about how faith works, that he, in the context of the disciples, was the one who was preparing and is going to give forth the harvest, was going to allow them to go and reap as Jesus here talks about with the disciples. Now what happens? Verse 39, right? She's ran to the city. And now what's happening? Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. It's so beautiful in John's gospel that what Jesus does is his first public ministry revealing of who he is and what he's come to do is with a group of Samaritans in a foreign land with great conflict with the Jews. And what happens? They're the ones that come streaming out to see him and and hear more and more from him and he stays with them and, and they believe, as John tells us, for the first that he is the savior of the world. Right? The only one that said this before is John the Baptist so far in John's gospel. And now we run forward to a bunch of Samaritans, and they're the ones that are confessing that Jesus is the Savior of the world, not even connected to the Jews directly. In fact, the enemies of the Jews. And that's who Jesus goes to. And that's who confesses that he is indeed the Savior of the world. It's just, I mean, I don't know how to... It's hard for us to understand how this fits together because it's such an amazing story of what God has done through Jesus. I think the best way to sum it up, and we'll maybe reflect on this a little bit, is what John said in chapter 1. All right, verse 29. John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's who Jesus was identified. We heard the same message in Revelation 22, that the water flowed in the new Jerusalem from the throne where the Lamb was upon the throne. See, John's gospel, though it's hard to understand, there's so much imagery here and so much richness with it, and it, it's a huge telling of the, the good news of Jesus Christ. Ultimately, the story is, is that Jesus, the Son of God, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this Lamb of God has incredible imagery going back to Exodus and the exile and people being passed over with the blood of the Lamb on their doorpost so that they would survive. And ultimately, Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the Lamb of God who knows you personally He is the Lamb of God who promises and offers and gives his spirit and faith for you to worship 
He is a Lamb of God who unites this, this world from beginning to end. He is the Spirit who, who knits us together as the family of God and, and allows us this, this opportunity to worship him. And he's the same person who at that well that day sat with a woman who he knew intimately because he knew her history. And he chose to be, her, be there with her to give her the promise of eternal life. It's an amazing story. Um, I hope that you read it some more. I hope that you reflect on this story a bit here from what the woman at the well did in Samaria, how the disciples were still, in fact, in many ways, learning. The people of the town, the Samaritans, got it better than the disciples did, I think, at this point, <laughs> which is a whole other story. I think God has a little patience for us to, to work through this as his followers. Amen? So as we think about this, Aaron, you want to talk about the, I, I, I enjoy this part, right? So I kind of walk through the scriptures, and you're hearing messages, um, and the spirit I trust is working. So you want to share today? We're not going to do this every week, but it's been a couple weeks here, which has been fun to do. Are you having fun with this or no? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot of water. So I know that's a repeat, but I know how to put blue on a board. So we've got... <laughs> Um, the Revelation, the book of Revelation, Revelation River, it's a good image for us to remember that from nothing then comes life, but it's an interaction in between that, in that river journey with Jesus, who's the Alpha and the Omega, and the woman at the well, who, I mean, I would have driven, drawn her, she's kind of downtrodden right here, I would give a happy face, but didn't have time to do that, so... You get one woman, that's all you get. She's downtrodden, but... She's a big this, heart, though. This well comes the, the new life in her heart of everlasting water that flows through her herself and her innermost being that gives her life everlasting. This prompts her into these arrows of um, returning to the Lord, Samaria, not Grism, and the Samarian village coming back to worship in spirit and truth. We've got the spirit, a little bit of fire, the truth, the Bible. And they're coming back through this. The disciples, they're confused. And they then hear a story about oh, the harvest. The harvest. Yeah. And if one seed falls, new life comes. Hmm. Um, and this is the river bringing life. So that's earlier. So there you go. Very simple. No, it's beautiful. But I mean, um, yeah, praise God. Between John's gospel, between me talking, the pictures, Aaron's expl explanation, is there something that stands out for anyone here today about this? The big heart. And Rosalinda, how does, how does that, what do you think that does for you yeah oh yeah think about oh that's beautiful that's I mean think about how much she was probably looking to be loved multiple husbands in a city where she probably was marginal not probably she would have been marginalized and outcast I mean going to the well in the midday she probably had no love in her life or very little we don't think about her parents. I mean, you could think about if, in that gener in that setting, if if a child is is showing poorly on the parents, they you know they kick them aside too. I mean, maybe that's some of your experiences. Just think about how much oh, it's beautiful. Think about how much she was missing love. And who shows up? The Son of God. Hmm. You imagine that Jesus did this with a lot of people, but for some reason, John chose to share this story. And what the impact was. Because she let that, that big heart, that love flow. And, and if she's being forgiven, she was able to offer that to the others that probably had hurt her in town and wants to share. It's an amazing part of how, how the love of God can can change us in ways that we just don't want revenge, hopefully, 
But if we realize that in spite of everything, someone that actually knows me better than I know myself, the one person that knows me better than anyone else in this world, if he's willing to love me and to die for me and to give me his spirit, why can't I offer that to other people? Yeah, beautiful. Other reflections on any of this? Yeah, please. Anybody almost, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Abel, it's, it's, I know myself, I can, can be kind of, easy, it's easier to sit back sometimes and need someone, in, someone in, needs in help or, or what, whatever the situation is, but maybe the invitation is, is, that, is that we can offer that out. Let the Lord do what he wants to with it, right? But if we see them, there's an, oper- an invitation for us to share with others that maybe we don't think we can do today. And, I guess, and that's the beautiful part. We talk about the Spirit of God that is over all of this, that we have this opportunity, and who knows if it lands or if it connects or not, but if we don't take invitation, we'll never know. And God's ways are not our ways, and that's the beautiful part of this, that he would go into a bunch of Samaritans who had been you know, enemies from the Jews, and he would do it this way. And I think, again, John tells it for a reason, but that's the invitation we have, is, is those that maybe they are in a different neighborhood or they look differently than we are. There might be little windows that I, I pray that this week, the next couple of weeks, that you see those in ways a little bit differently. I mean, just take the step, and, and whether you, you speak to the person or not, maybe you, maybe you just take a step of praying for them at the time. Maybe you're okay to, to kind of step out a little bit more. I mean, you'll see, you'll be in that situation. But regardless, the Lord's at work. The Lord is there with you. He's comforting you and giving you the opportunity. So yeah, that's beautiful. What'd you take away, Sarah? busy. We don't feel like we're worthy. Hmm. He continues to provide us with that willingness. Yeah. Yeah, it's the promise, like the song we sang about, it's always moving. That when we were singing that stanza, I was hearing that, right? The Lord's always active. It doesn't mean that he's busy, a busybody. He's just always active, right? And so even though we might not kind of see what's going on, he's still working on it for us. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'm glad that you're here this morning. That goes, Sylvia's, thanks for your work with the children and that you get to see this kind of live versus it being a replay. <laughs> yeah, Doug? I love the part about worshiping in the spirit. Mm. Yeah. Once again, he's just making it so easy for us to come to him. All the obstacles, doing this, doing that, just put it aside, come to me with your spirit. Yeah. And what's interesting about worshiping in spirit and truth is that we're, the God's spirit in us, we're just returning to him, right? So it doesn't have to look a certain way. It doesn't have to be in a certain place. I love the fact in getting together as God's people in here, we're going to share the gifts of, of singing together, the Lord's Supper today. But that worship in the spirit can be anywhere. You know, if my wife was sharing, she would talk about a hike we did this summer um, in Colorado. Do you want to share The time, the quiet time you had with the Lord on the trail? Yeah, very intimate and personal in this vast, like we were in Colorado in the mountains, and it's like 
look around this, you know, hugeness, but it was very personal as you've shared. And I think, Doug, for you, you, you know, obviously you, you worship and you're, you know, you're up here playing and singing. So it probably is kind of musical a lot of times for you to worship the Lord as he's wired you. But for others, it might be just stopping and, and kind of putting some of the noises in life aside for a bit. Maybe it's putting our phone down, <laughs> turning the TV off. Maybe it's in the morning, you know. I know my, my, my son, I, I'm up early and I enjoy that kind of quiet time before the sun rises. You know, and, and I think the invitation is God's wired us all differently. And so the promise is that his spirit is present. And however he's, however he's wired you, whatever those, wherever those things show up, tap into that a little bit more. Maybe this week the Spirit will, will help you see this is an area where I can, I'm already here. And I think, oh yeah, that's, that was a nourishing 20 minutes or whatever it is. That was a worshipful, prayerful, whatever the situation is. Maybe you find those little, little glimpses through your week, right? And just kind of take some, a little extra time. And it's like, oh, that's it. Maybe you start doing that a little bit more each day. Whatever it is, there's something, there's something that the Lord has that he he can speak to you and you can hear him a little bit differently and that worship in spirit and truth can occur. Because I know it's going to happen because it's based on the promise of God. <laughs> it's not because you're doing it right or whatever. It's because God promises for his spirit to be present. See, this, this talk from Jesus isn't like, okay, go take that class on how to worship in spirit and truth and then once you get it right, then I'll be present. That's not it. It's already there. It's already present. God's spirit is in you. And you might say, ah, okay, whatever. Whatever, Rob. I get that. That's fine. I, was, I was one of them <laughs> for a while. I'll be fair. I'll be honest about it. It's like, yeah, I don't know. I'm not kind of like a very creative person. That's why Aaron's drawing. I can't sing very well, though I sing loud, sorry. Um, you know, all these kinds of things, all the reasons why, no, I don't really worship well. And, you know, I trust. I get in here and I love the, the word of the Lord and, and the things we get to share in faith. But spirit presence, eh. he's broken me of that in the last, you know, three, four years, I'll tell you. He has really broken me on that part of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whatever you do, do to the glory of God. Well, see, let's, let's kind of take some building blocks here. God's ways are not our ways. What's important to God, he will accomplish. We don't always know how that looks. So first of all, God's ways are not our ways. It's not us trying to figure out how to work, do it to the glory of God. Then let's kind of layer in the spirit on this. God's spirit is present in his believers, in all of creation, and so he's accomplishing things as he wants to. And so on some level, do it to the glory of God is acknowledging, just acknowledging. Thanks, God. And then just going about your day. It's not like somehow like I have to go sit in a prayer room and pray for 18 hours. That's not, that's not what he's asking. He's asking for us to acknowledge that he is God. We're going to confess the creed, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. That's the greatest statement in that whole creed. What does it mean to have a Lord? It's someone that we submit to. It's someone that we look to. It's someone that we honor, cherish, love. We go to with problems because they're going to take care of us. And Jesus, our Lord, is in all things. He's active all the time. He doesn't tell you which job to take. He tells you to get busy and work. <laughs> so there's an incredible freedom in this to the glory of God, because the Spirit of God is present, always, always working out what God wants. We don't have to predict how it's going to turn out. Let God do it. Just, you know, go on to the things you have in relationships as kids and parents and neighbors and workers and whatever it is. Just go do it. God will work it out to the glory of God. And I think this spirit and truth is a huge part of that. Oh, did so I checked with, if you were here last week, I checked with Victor. Right? Victor and Robert said they were going to read John 1 through 3. Victor read it this morning. He said, I want to talk to you about it some more, Rob. I said, awesome. Praise God. And he sent a note to Robert, I don't have Robert's number, to encourage him to read John 1 through 3. I'm not sure if he did or not. So my encouragement today is this week, read John 1 through 4. There's a lot there. 
Just take some time. And if you get all the way through it, praise God. If not, that's okay. But maybe there's something in there for you that the Spirit has to say that you're going to, maybe you're not going to leave your jar at the well and run into town to tell people, but maybe you'll be a little bit more sensitive to that opening with someone to step out and talk to them. Maybe you'll be a little bit more aware of the love that God has for you in a way that it overflows and spills out in your life and you can share that with others. Maybe as you're going about your day's activities, you'll have a thought and say a prayer to the glory of God, just as you're kind of cruising along. Maybe you'll be aware of the Spirit in your life and find that quiet moment where Jesus, or the Spirit of God, might show up, just to encourage you. Amen?